I'm going to ask you a question this morning. It's going to test your memory a little bit. And it's probably going to show your age, but hey, we're online. Nobody knows, so who cares, right? How many of you remember a singer from the 70s by the name of Jim Croce? You may not remember that name, but you'll probably remember some of his songs. One of them began, if I could save time in a bottle, the first thing that I'd like to do. And another one says, you don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't take the mask off the old Lone Ranger and you don't mess around with Jim. Remember that one? One of the last ones he wrote began with these words. Like the pine trees lining the winding road, I've got a name. I've got a name. Like the singing bird and the croaking toad, I've got a name. I've got a name. And then the next line in that song says, and I carry it with me like my daddy did. What do you think he meant by that? I carry it with me like my daddy did. I mean all sorts of things, but I did a little bit of research and I found something interesting. Guess what Jim Croce's father's name was? Jim Croce. He was named after his father. And in that song, he's honoring the memory of his father and saying he's proud of his father's name. He bore his father's name and he gave him his identity. In other words, he knew who he was. My question for you this morning is, do you know who you are? What name do you bear? Acts 2.38 says we were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we bear the name of Jesus. We bear the name of Christ. That's why we're called Christians. The word Christian simply means a follower of Christ. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he said in 1, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, that he was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So let me ask you again. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you belong to? Now you'd think that would be obvious, wouldn't you? But too many times we forget. People are forgetful and when they take their eyes off of Jesus and start gazing at someone or something else, they can get attached to them. That was a problem in the early church as well. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 11, My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. See, some people in Corinth had taken their eyes off of Jesus, and they had begun to brag about who had baptized them. And Paul's basically saying, I'm glad I didn't get in the middle of all that mess. Now, true, he had baptized a few people, but he usually left that to somebody else so he could focus on preaching the gospel. And that was a good thing because then he wouldn't be put in the embarrassing situation of having upstaged Christ. Paul didn't die for the Corinthians. Jesus did. Here lately we've seen some people in America identify themselves as African Americans or Irish Americans or Mexican Americans or whatever. And I'm not saying that we can't be proud of our heritage, but I am saying that a lot of what that has, has happened with that is it has stirred up a bunch of trouble. That's true that I have some Scotch and some German blood in my ancestry. And I'm proud of that. We have a depiction of, of the, the Macintosh Tartan and the Macintosh family crest. But you know what? I'm not Scottish and I'm not German. I'm an American. And that should be true of everyone who wants to be a citizen of this country. Now, lest I get sidetracked here on some political things, let me move on. Because sometimes that same thing happens in religious circles. Christians want to identify with whoever it is that is known for teaching the, the uh, theology that they ascribe to. Let me tell you about a fellow that you probably never heard of. His name was Jacobus Arminius. 
again, you probably haven't heard his name before, but he taught that men and women are free and have a free will, as opposed to Calvinism, which taught that they don't. You know what? I agree with a lot of what Arminius said, but I'm not an Arminian Christian. I'm simply a Christian. Arminius didn't die for me. Christ did, and I belong to him, and that's all the identification that I need. In our brotherhood, some of the foundational thinkers were people like Thomas Campbell and Raccoon John Smith and Alexander Campbell and others, and they were decent men who shared a a, a common desire to get back to the scriptures as our only rule of faith and authority. And I agree with them. I agree with them wholeheartedly. But they didn't die for me. I'm not a Campbellite Christian. I belong only to Christ, first, foremost, and always. One of the mottos in the early brotherhood was this. We're not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. We want the world to know nothing more about us than that we belong to Jesus Christ because he was crucified for us and he rose again to make us God's children. Now what that means for us is that we want to make Jesus and his book our sole authority. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 says, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus has total authority as our Lord and Christ. And his book, the Bible, is what tells us what he wants us to do. That's why our brethren has another motto that says, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. We strongly believe what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And while you might think that most churches would agree with that, I mean, it, it seems to make sense and seems to say what the Bible says, right? In practice, a lot of them don't. Too often they feel like they owe allegiance to their creeds, to their books of doctrine, or to their governing bodies. And it's almost as if they place those things on top of the scriptures and then filter God's words through them. Several years ago, there was a movement that started in our brotherhood to try to find some grounds of unity with other denominations. They called themselves one body, and they just wanted to get people together to talk about uh, the scripture. Uh, they were confident in the power of the scripture that it had the power to break down any barriers that existed between these different groups. And what they did was they would have some of their speakers get up and preach, and then they have some of the other people's speakers get up and preach. And then they'd have a breakout session where they would discuss what the two groups had said, and they could try to find their common ground as, talk about as, as well as talking about their differences. But after a couple sessions, it became obvious that there was a difference in the way they were presenting their, their messages. The speakers from our brotherhood would speak with power and confidence that came from years of experience. <clears throat> but the speakers from the other group would get up and basically read a prepared speech, verbatim. Someone later asked what was going on, why they did that, and they said they had to submit their sermons to their denominational headquarters ahead of time to make sure that what they were saying conformed to denominational doctrine. It apparently wasn't good enough to have their speakers preach from the scriptures. They had to also toe the party line. And that's just not an issue with churches. Sometimes it's an issue with individual Christians. And the party line sometimes is whatever their popular preacher happens to be saying on TV or on the radio at the time. They don't read the Bible for themselves. They just trust their favorite biblical authority without question. And that's dangerous. I don't care who your favorite authority is. By contrast, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, there's a group of people there who refuse to accept Paul's preaching at face value. They listen to him, but then it says, uh, it says they were a more noble character. I'm talking about the Bereans, they were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. These folks are said to be noble because their authority was the Bible. It wasn't Paul, it was the Bible. 
How many of you know who Alex Trebek is? I bet you all do. For years, he's been the host of a very popular game show on TV called Jeopardy. And on occasion, he will ask or allow the, the, the studio audience to ask questions about how things are handled behind the scenes. One of the most frequent questions that he gets asked is, how many of the answers to the questions do you know? And Alex always replies, all of them, because I have them in front of me. <laughs> That's the advantage we have when we take Jesus at his word and we trust the scriptures. We have all the answers right in front of us in the Bible. If you say you believe in Jesus, but you don't trust the Bible, you're fooling yourself because the only source of information we have about Jesus is the Bible. It's right there for us in the word of God. We don't have any other information. Now, one last thing. A little bit ago, I quoted part of one of our old mottos, and I said, no creed but Christ and no book but the Bible. But that's not all the quote. The rest of it says, no law but love. And what that means is if we belong to Jesus, we're going to obey his commands. And the most powerful command that Jesus ever gave us is to love one another. He said in John chapter 15, verse 12, my command is this. Love one another as I have loved you. So we're supposed to love one another. And some might think, well, what that means is we're supposed to love the, the one another's, the other Christians. I'm not required to love anybody else. I've even met people before who've told me that we don't have to love anybody who isn't a Christian. Well, just in case you may be tempted to believe that, I want you to remember a time when a, law, a young lawyer came up to Jesus and asked him, a question. He said, what's the greatest commandment? And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that begs the question, who is your neighbor? In fact, in Luke's account of this exchange, it records that someone actually asked Jesus that very question, who is my neighbor? And in answer, Jesus told a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the story. A man's beaten and left for dead alongside the road and, and three people pass by. The first two are religious folks and they just pass by without offering any help. The third person that comes by is a, is a despised Samaritan. And he stopped, he took pity on him, he tended the man's wounds, took him to a, a, a hotel and left him there, paid his bill and told the innkeeper, I'll be back. And when I come back, I'll pay anything else he owes. Take care of him. And Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man? Well, of course, the lawyer said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. If you wear the name of Christ, you are commanded to not only love your fellow Christians, but also your neighbor, who may or may not be a Christian. Paul summarized it for us in Romans chapter 13, verse 10, where he said, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. I don't know how many of you are involved with social media and follow anything on social media like Facebook. I know some of you are. But I've noticed that a lot of otherwise decent people have convinced themselves that it's okay to hate on Democrats or hate on Republicans or hate on the president or hate on Congress or whoever's making the headlines today. And I've come to the conclusion that if you claim, claim to be a Christian, that you need to go through your social media postings and ask yourself, do I hate someone or some group more than I love Jesus. And the way you can know that's happened is if when you count the times you have shared your praise of Jesus and compare it to the number of times that you have shared or liked spiteful posts of politicians or others and see which one adds up to the more. But you know what? It doesn't take a majority to know your hatred and even just one post will betray you and show that you have a problem. Be very careful that you do not dishonor the name of Christ, which you wear by what you share on social media. James 3, verses 9 and 10 says, 
With our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Now, having said that, I have to confess that I've been just as tempted to do those things as the next person. There's stuff that happens in this world and in the media, and it has a tendency to kind of set me off. And I find that I want to make my frustrations known to everyone who will listen. But as a man who bears the name of Christ, I can't do that. And neither should you. And if we are, we need to cut it out. So, do you know who you are? Do you know who you belong to? Like Jim Croce saying, we've got a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. It's him we belong to. Not some political party. Not even a country like the United States of America. We are called to be first and foremost Christians. And Christians only. So remember whose name you bear. Jesus died for you and me. And he and his book are to be our only valid authority. We must be people led by the idea that there is no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, and no law but love. Thank you.